We live in a day when the eyes of the nation are on the school campus. Today, we will hear from adults about what we can do to help make schools and students safer. There's no question that there's an overwhelming majority that believes we need to do more to make schools safe, but how we do that is a bit more complicated. Today, we're following up with a teacher from Parkland, Florida, and we'll look at statistics about what youth workers are saying, as well as some adult interviews hearing from them directly. This episode is important for our time. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jeff Eckert. I'm Jason Brewer. And this is The Thought Factory. The Thought Factory podcast is brought to you by Never the Same, cultivating students through biblical discipleship and spiritual disciplines using theology, community, and technology. Learn more at neverthesame.org. Glad you're with us today. We're jumping into kind of a serious topic. Before we do that, talk about a few things, get a few things out of the way. One of those things is that this season, if you're joining us, we're adding a bonus segment, Jason, at the end where we're going to be talking about something we're working on. Every time that you hear bonus segment, you're going to find it at the end of this podcast when there is no more music. Just wait about eight seconds and there you will find some added information about what's going on here. So it's kind of like a little Easter egg on every episode that we're doing here lately. We're excited about uh, something that we are working on that we're hosting a national uh, event gathering somewhere down the road. So you hear more about that later. Also, if you are interested in learning more about where we're getting the information that we use to guide this podcast, Jason, where can they get a copy for themselves? We have a free gift for them and you can find this gift at neverthesame.org backslash podcast. This gift is called our trend report. It's the Adolescents in the Church trend report. Beautifully done. It illustrates all the stats that we have been pulling from in the last year in regards to what students think and what adults think students are thinking. And so if you want this free gift from us at neverthesame.org backslash podcast. So our last episode, we talked about politicizing schools and students view. Today, we're going to talk about adults. So if you haven't heard our last episode, I want to encourage you to go back, check that out, where we hear directly from some students and interviews, as well as what their beliefs are statistically. It was pretty interesting, Jason, as we got into that. Today, we're going to get into what adults are thinking. In the next episode, we are going to be looking at the spiritual growth of a student and really what causes that spiritual growth. There's many factors, but one, we want to just key in on. And so you will want to check that episode out. So we recently, Jason, last season, we we did an episode really on the fly. Usually we record these and have a little bit of time to to put them out, but we recorded something as a result of something happened on February 14th of this year as we record this. Yeah, the school shooting that happened in Parkland, Florida, we were able to connect with a teacher that is in the district of Parkland. And get his first hand account of what he had to go through as the emergency uh, reports were coming through. The shooter was heading towards his school that was about a mile away from the high school that where the, the shooting was occurring. And so he was in lockdown. The students had no idea. He didn't have any idea until some of the texts were starting to trickle in. So we were able to just hear from him what that was like, what the response was from the students. And so we just wanted to follow up with him and see what what has changed since because obviously something that traumatic is going to cause change it's going to cause change in the policies it's going to cause change in behavior from the students and teachers and and so we just wanted to hear from him what what was the update since then i was pretty spellbound as we interviewed josh he's a good friend of ours and uh, to hear his perspective on what was happening what it was like to be sitting in that classroom totally in the dark literally and figuratively not knowing what was going on as they waited out that situation. So again, that episode was pretty riveting. And that episode is episode 403 from last season. It's called Code Red Response to the School Shooting. You might want to go back and listen to that interview with Josh, get a little context if you haven't heard that, because we're going to follow up with him today and hear from Josh about what he has to say in response to what what it's been like since an event like that's happened. A lot of times an event will happen in the news and there's a news spike about it and then culture moves on, but we don't really hear much about what the aftermath of something like that is. Well, today we have a guest, a special guest with us, Joshua Liggins. He has been on this podcast in the past. 
We interviewed him within 24 hours of the school shooting in Parkland, Florida at Stoneman Douglas High School. He is a teacher in Brower County, Coral Springs Middle School, which is all of a stone's throw away from the high school. Welcome to the Thought Factory podcast. Thank you for joining us, Josh. Hey, always good to hang out with you guys. Well, we wanted to follow up with you in regards to what happened, but also the news cycle can really be hot and spiking after a, something like this, as traumatic as it is, the school shooting. And then it kind of just simmers and cools down and people move on. And really, we wanted to get your insight with your involvement in the district and how close you were to the shooting and see what has changed. Because we are talking about students and feeling safe in school and school safety, but gun control and the topic of guns and arming teachers and all of this stuff. And we just wanted to reach out to you and discuss. You went into lockdown. You were starting to get texts of what was happening in the emergency, and it was all of a mile away. Talk to us about the rest of the school year from February through June of how has that school shooting changed your school? As you said, as far as national attention, things simmered down eventually and you know, there was the, the next shooting and the next story and Kavanaugh case and all sort of other things that have taken the media attention nationally. As far as it goes here, it's like it happened yesterday. Hmm. Um, everybody is still uh, tremendously impacted. We see the families all the time. I just saw the student that was close to me, Jamie Guttenberg. I saw her mom a few weeks ago doing a fundraiser, you know, just seeing them, you break down in tears. And as she says, you know, this is her life now, everybody she sees, she makes them cry. And so, um, yeah, our lives are, are never going to be the same, uh, from what happened on Valentine's day of all days, uh, of 2018. So, uh, the rest of the school year was very tense, I guess would be the word. Uh, there was always concerns of, is this going to happen again? Is there going to be a copycat? Are our schools protected enough uh, to stop anything from happening again? There was frustration, you know, from different camps on on where you were at, you know, as far as what you believe should be done or, or could have prevented such a thing. Because of that, it, it caused a lot of attrition. I know there's a lot of teachers, including myself, that are not teaching again this year. Some some in part because of the shooting, some totally because of the shooting. Our, our county is pretty broken and, and pretty divided, if you ask me. I think initially people were a lot more patient and um, less vocal as to not offend, you know, those that are hurting. And I think as time has gone on and the frustrations have increased, people have become much more vocal on both sides. The one word I could say to describe the rest of the school year uh, would be just frustrated frustrated and hurt, frustrated knowing that young people, um, people that's, that sat in our classrooms, we'll never see them again. You know, parents that drop their kids off at school, said, I love you and, and expect to pick them up, you know, with them having a better education that day, they're never going to see them again. And then, and then sympathizing with them to imagine what would it be like if that was you and your child was gone because somebody showed up on campus and started just firing off bullets at everyone. One of the students that you mentioned, Jamie, was a student that was dropped off at school. You referenced her in the other episode in regards to this. She's a former student of yours, and yeah. she was murdered that day. Now you're you're dealing with the personal effect of those you know, former students, parents. How has the effect of this tragedy have been on the students themselves, just their behavior, their mentality, their approach to other people, to teachers? Depending on the background of the student, varying results. So there are some students that were very close with those kids, you know, very close with the Douglas community. Maybe their brothers or sisters went to school there and they were traumatized, man. Whenever we'd have a fire drill or a tornado drill or anything like that, you know, they'd be freaking out. Their parents would come pick them up from school. And I mean, at, at any hint of danger, they were out of there. We don't think about this, but in South Florida, it's a big area of immigration. And so we have some students that have run from genocide in other areas. And some of them, they don't know a lot of people in Douglas and they didn't really care. They're kind of like, we're in America and things are great. And they just 
continue on about their lives. And so I think for even for some of the teachers, it was difficult to see kids the next day that were hurting and it has us breaking down in tears, but it was also difficult to see kids that came in the next day and they weren't hurting, you know, and the rest of the week they weren't hurting depending on, you know, what their upbringing was and their, and their circumstance. So I think it's, it's created a brotherhood. I say a band of brothers where people are much more inclined to be there for each other, to support one another, to consider mental illness and, and reporting things and, and just trying to, to love each other. I know a lot of students that have forgiven other people for things that as a, as a child, they don't realize it's petty, right? Oh, well, you know, you're talking to my old boyfriend, uh, this and that, and they're fighting in school and things like that. A lot of those things that dissolve, they realize life is short. And even at 12, 13, 14 years old, your life could unfortunately be snatched by somebody. You mentioned love, forgiveness, community, all characteristics of the Christian faith as well. Talk to us about the role that faith played for you as a, a public school teacher. When I see tragedies like this, man, I'm just reminded of the wickedness that's in this world and what Christ came to purge and the hope and joy that we have of a future of, of never having to be in situations like this. Although I'm, I'm hurt by the tragedy of it, I'm encouraged that one day we'll be in an eternity with Christ and I'll never have to be sitting in a in a cold red with students looking at their snapchats with dead bodies coming through and them asking me what to do what to do you know i never have to have a wonderful person in my life like jamie guttenberg uh, who's among the most delightful people i've ever met and to know that she's been shot seven times by you know an armor light rifle faith grounds me and and the the hope of Christ and the promise of Christ that um, to to persevere and and be steadfast that you know our promises that will one day not have to be like this and so I try to encourage staff members and you know and and people in my circle and that you know some of them are Christ followers and they're with it and others of them you know aren't religious at all and they really weren't trying to hear it you know the question of if your God is so merciful and if your God is so great, why would you let somebody like that be brutally murdered, you know? And so, you know, it's, it's tough. I have my personal theological answers, you know, that I, I share with them. I, I often say, I don't think God had anything to do with Jamie Guttenberg being brutally murdered. I think that's the work of Satan. And I think that's the work of humans choosing against the Lord. And, and this is what he promised it would be like, you know, if, if we did that. We can easily blame God when something like this happens and, and ask the question why and start to place laws in and policies and procedures in place to eradicate this type of behavior. And we, as Christ followers, we believe that it's not necessarily the laws that are going to change the land, but it's going to be the hearts of man that's going to change the land. But at the same right. time, reality is we operate in, in places that have to have policies and procedures in place to protect us, especially a school. How has those policies and laws and, and procedures changed because of this? There's been laws passed by the governor. There's an advocate in the area named Andrew Pollack that's done a tremendous work. But I don't think anybody, including him, is really satisfied with the things that have been implemented. Now, again, I don't know them all. I know Douglas has had a tremendous police presence the end of last school year and the beginning of this year. Uh, they've instituted policies that are like, you can't have a book bag without it being clear. Mm -hmm. So, you know, everything that you bring on campus and vis is visible. I believe Douglas has metal detectors and things like that now. I, I couldn't confirm that. I know the school that I was at we don't have metal detectors and things like that. Certain gates have to be locked, you know, certain hours where people can come. I know even to visit the school I was at, you have to register 24 hours in advance so they could do a background check. Um, there's been a heightened security as far as getting more schools to have somebody armed there to defend them. There's a lot of different things that are going on, but I don't personally feel like there's anything implemented that could stop another tragedy like that from happening again. 
as a man of many opinions uh, and strong convictions and thoughts that are uh, based in wisdom, what is your recommendation on how to make schools safer based on what you know in a school, but also your thoughts in what is the deeper issues and, and all that? I think my wife would affirm man of many opinions. I don't know if wisdom would always <laughs> be the answer uh, she would throw in there. But I, I always have an opinion. And I will admit that I'm not an expert in this. You know, I'm just responding with the things that I see. I think that schools should, you know, seek out and hire security firms, companies, whatever, and let them do like risk assessments of, hey, how could we secure these places? I think that would be a great first step in figuring out, you know, what our campuses uh, are going to be like. I think if one of the senators were showing up to a campus one day or a governor or something like that, they would they would do a full assessment and they would say, hey, where are the possible threats in this area? What kind of things do we need to shut down? Uh, and I think that schools should do a thorough evaluation like that for the lives that that they have on campus and are aiming to teach, you know? And I was like, and, and if we're not gonna take that approach, if we're just gonna try to live in some utopia where we say these kind of things don't happen, then I think these things are gonna happen again and we're just gonna be more and more frustrated. Uh, one of the things that I've heard is different, you know, when you're looking at an area like Detroit, and Detroit is where I grew up. Detroit has extreme gun violence. I didn't know that it was uncommon for people to be getting murdered in your city until I moved out of Detroit. Being somebody that comes from Detroit and being around gun violence and things like that, you hardly hear about our schools being shot up. You know, you can get shot on your way home. You can get shot at a party somewhere. But the school shooting thing isn't that common of a happening. And I think it's because their buildings are set up with, with minimal entry points. So you're, you're not easily going to get onto this campus. Uh, they plan things around knowing they have violence in their area and, and what is the best way to have school functions and things like that without allowing people to be here that could possibly be violent. So public school league games start immediately after school. So the, the big high school game starts at 2.30, you know, as opposed to other areas where they want, you know, the whole city to come. Why? Because they're going to make sure that their kids are protected. Um, allowing police officers to be on campus and carrying their rifles or whatever with them. Our SRO, so our school resource officer, a situation popped off at our school, they have to run back to their car to get the rifle because they're not allowed to have it on campus and then pursue the person. So depending on where they're at on campus, I mean, that could be five minutes for them to get back to their car. Hmm. And then another however many minutes to find this person, you know, 10 minutes later, this person, Nicholas Cruz, accomplished that massacre in six minutes. Every campus should have metal detecting without a question. That should be a no brainer Metal detectors are going to be on every campus. Bulletproof windows should be on every campus. Like we should put our resources toward those things. And we don't. Those those are just some of the things I think would make a tremendous difference from the defensive side. And then from the offensive, let's deal with issues of mental health. It's, it's frustrating, man. It's frustrating to know that there's a lot we could have done that could have prevented this. And You mentioned people on campus ready to defend that kind of begs the question of those that are already on campus, the teachers and yeah. should teachers carry guns at school? I think it depends on the school. I think it depends on the, on the County. For example, growing up or sorry, not growing up, but living in Broward or in Barry County, my apologies, living in Barry County, everybody I knew out there carried guns. You know, they were familiar with how to be responsible with their gun it wasn't anything that was ever brandished. It wasn't anything they were uncomfortable with. The oldest of ladies that went to Thornapple Valley Church when we were out there, you know, had Glocks on them. Mm. <laughs> and and you'd, have, you'd have never known. So if you're talking about an area like Barry County, yeah, that's probably, you know, probable. There's Midwestern values, you know, a lot a lot of an area like TK or Caledonia. Yeah, it's, it's possibly something that could work. If you look at a school in like Chicago, though, or a school down here in Fort Lauderdale, 
I think you're setting yourself up for disaster. And and here's why. Most of the people that I work with have never touched a gun. They forget firing it, cleaning it, you know, no knowing how to put one in a chamber, release a magazine, just saying those things to them, they would think I'm speaking Chinese. And so if you're gonna allow those teachers to now carry guns to protect themselves, man, you're going to end up getting some kids shot because some of these teachers are going to be terrified in a situation. They're not going to know what to do. And now we've just invited a gun into that scenario. Also, in areas like Chicago, Detroit, you know, Fort Lauderdale, there's some very violent students, you know, more uncommon than what I was seeing in, let's say, a West Michigan, you know, somewhere like that. So, you know, you have a 70 year old lady and she's carrying a piece on her and then these kids get in a fight and then she comes try to detain them and then they yank that gun off of her now they're shooting people you know and now they have a gun on campus that they wouldn't have had access to before and so i i think it depends on your area i mean maybe it could be done in a way where certain people are trained police trained have to go through some maybe some sort of academy training and their pay is tremendously increased for taking on that liability. Uh, yeah, I think that could work. But short of that, I don't think you want to just invite weapons on a campus without teachers adequately knowing how to use them. Now, I, I say that, but I also know that when I was when it was a cold red lockdown and I was sitting there with just a pair of scissors, you know, not knowing who might possibly come through this door, I thoroughly wanted my Springfield XD40 on me, you know, and I I felt robbed of the opportunity to have it. And so I, I don't think we can have equality in that. I'll say that there's some other teachers that I'm not even sure should be teaching. And if we allow them to have guns, that could be that could be to the detriment of a lot of people. Well, clearly there is the sentiment that something has to happen. And as the conversation continues, it's this we don't know what, but man, students are feeling like adults need to figure this out and they need to figure this out quickly. And it's something that we need to do. We need to figure out how can we get students to feel safe at school and protected. And clearly there's frustration in your voice because of the experience that you went through, not just firsthand, but you're seeing the fear and the trauma in the students that you are, are leading, teaching, they're looking to you to lead. Praise the Lord that nothing happened at, at Coral Springs Middle School, but there is those moments that are unexpected and the students are looking to the, the school to protect them. And Josh, I do just appreciate your time and your thoughts on all of this. And it has changed something about the school campus. And uh, so I appreciate your time today and, and uh, joining us. I really appreciate it, brother, man. I, I covet your guys prayers often um we need them you know we we need them before this but you know we we definitely need them now man I, I just encourage encourage you guys man as you're talking to people you know and joining into this into this conversation don't come into it dogmatically come into it with an open heart of compassion and i think if if we start there man our country has a chance to of doing something great as far as setting a benchmark on how we're going to protect our kids well, let's let's continue to talk about what adults are saying. So Quinnipiac University, they did a survey and they showed that 58 percent of voters oppose allowing teachers and school officials to carry guns on school grounds. So it was 58 percent were against teachers carrying guns as opposed to 40 percent being in favor. On another note, these same people voted 82 percent in favor of having armed security officers in schools. So they're saying, 58% are saying no to teachers having guns, but 82% yes to having armed security guards at school. I think the majority of the responses are, something has to be done. Students, adults just don't know exactly what that looks like. And even for our own results from our, our research, it says, I feel that there is more we could do in our country to protect students in school. 88% say that's true. The students are saying, Absolutely. Overwhelmingly, that is a true statement. And 90, almost 95% of adults think that is a true statement for students as well. So there is this comment of there needs to be something that has to happen. And yet we don't know what it is. 
But then when we break it down into some options, carrying guns as teachers, that's a, an option. Thinking that there needs to be better security in our schools, that's an option. Stronger gun laws is an option. And when we ask students this question, what are your thoughts on gun control in regards to the school campus? Almost 48% say there should be better security in our schools. Yeah, 14% of our students are saying, I think teachers should carry guns. Obviously, there is the the hot topic of carrying guns and, you know, is that going to be allowed? And we heard from students in schools that are going, if teachers carried guns, that'd be more frightening for me as a student. There's so many things facing our students today. And when you, when you throw guns into the mix in any way, you know, we're not a political program here at all, but guns is such a polarizing thing. And we even talked in preparation for this that I really hesitate to even mention guns because people can just go crazy with it. But, but it is something that people are talking about it. Students are thinking about it. They're thinking about safety. They want to feel safe. We, as an adult, should not just ignore that and just go send them off to school and assume by default that they will feel safe, that they are safe, that nothing's going to happen. Well, times have changed. So what is it going to take? And yeah, when you say, well, there should be greater gun presence on the campus, I'm not sure about that. But what are we doing as a country? And in the last episode... We mentioned, I don't think I mentioned her name, but a friend of ours, friend of mine, Kathy, who really studies a lot about neuroscience, says that for adolescents to, to learn in a learning environment, to be able to learn, they answer those two questions. Am, am I safe and am I loved? When you think about that safety issue, if, if that's on their mind, if they're thinking about what would it be like if my teacher were carrying a gun right now? Maybe that's completely frightening to them or maybe it's comforting to them and it's strange to think it could be either way depending on the student but we as adults i think everyone in society is saying and believes we need to do something i want to share what i think is the solution at the end of this episode because i think it's important for us to be thinking about what can we do now this summer i interviewed um several adults and just sat down with a group of them and asked them what they thought about students and safety and let's hear from them let's talk about schools and safety that's been a huge issue here this last year what uh what do you think students thoughts are from your experience what are they talking about when it comes to like guns and gun control and school safety i mean i think they want safety and they value safety um but I don't think they're as passionate about it as people, like kids in other schools because that's not the biggest issue in our Midwestern schools right now. Yeah, it's interesting, the dynamic um, of students that we work with, because we have some students that are um, on one, very far on one end of the spectrum and other students that are on the complete other end. And so we have a like varying, I think, viewpoint as a, as a youth ministry of high school students um, on those things, but I think the one thing that's in common in all of them is that something needs to change. Um, and, and they don't necessarily know what needs to change. Um, I think that they know what it shouldn't be in some in some extents, but um, I think a lot of students, um, they don't necessarily think about it every single time they walk through their school doors, but when they see it on the news, if something happened in this state, something happened in that school, um, I think it does hit home for them, like, this is very real. I think amongst our students, there isn't a whole lot of discussion politically, but there are, like in the one-on-ones, I think is where more than anything, because a lot of students don't want to admit that they feel fear. Um, that, like we, we don't like to show or share weakness, but I've, I've had a number of conversations. I got into an argument with this student um, and I'm scared they're gonna do something. Um, I think, right, this is what they're seeing on the news all the time. Um, now, again, our students are fairly relaxed. They're not the most politically charged, but there is a definite sense of fear going into school when there is drama and things like that. And being that it's high school, that means there is drama frequently. And so on an individual basis, I think our students are at different times and occasions feeling um, unsafe. I think it's interesting because this topic, whether we want it to or not, has been tied to politics so strongly. And I'd say we're in a pretty, um, like, 
a more politically conservative area. And so whatever that means for the individual and their family and what they think about gun control really translates, I think, to the conversations I have with students. Um, oftentimes what their parents say or what they, how they vote or how they feel about guns, whether they um, have property and like that's part of their recreation or whether that is um, absolutely horrifying and they've had gun violence in their family, I think that is the lens that students are approaching the topic of, of safety in schools with. A lot of school shootings tend to come out of um, mental health. Um, and some, don't get me wrong, there's, there's not a cookie cutter mold as to, oh, A plus B equals C. Um, but a lot of times, the number of times you hear, you know, this person obviously was not, not quite, something was off and nothing was done about it even after we brought up concerns to the school, is honestly, just absolutely sad um, and I was in an interesting spot with a lot of the bigger shootings that happened recently where I was actually not in America at the time and I heard a lot of perspectives from people outside of our country which was really an interesting way to hear about things um, so I might not be in the best spot to answer this question just because I wasn't talking to American youth at the time but um, in general, I feel like there, there is a sense of fear and a f sense of something needs to change, but I don't think there's generally a huge idea of, okay, this is exactly what needs to change. We're in a battle for the heart and soul of our nation right now, and the school campus is, is really the focus. It's where so much is converging, so much of what's happening in culture, the violence, the lack of respect, overall in society not just students but adults everyone there there's so little respect there's so little love and if we are going to make schools safer we've got to change the heart of the people and when we look at all the external things and i look back and you look at what the scripture has to say overall laws are there to guide and govern but they can't change a person's heart and there is no way schools are going to be safer until the hearts of students, the hearts of teachers, even the heart of our nation has changed. That's why we here at Never the Same, and with Claim Your Campus especially, we believe that students praying is a specific solution because what prayer can do is it can ask and appeal to God, the God of heaven, the God that, that has the ability to change the heart of a person if they allow him to do it. That's what we need. I want you to join us in our efforts to see student-led prayer at every campus in America. Claim your campus, our mission, our goal, our desire, our dream is to see one million students, middle school and high school, is united in prayer. That's 15 meeting every week at, at their school to pray at 67,000 schools across the United States. Join us in our efforts with Claim Your Campus. We're gonna talk about it more in the bonus segment, but let me encourage you right now, go to claimyourcampus.com, you can download the app, if you as an adult are listening to this and you want to get directly involved and connected, go to Facebook, go to Claim Your Campus Adult Advocates, join that group as we're talking, equipping, and dialoguing about what we as adults can do to encourage schools and students to be places of prayer and safer places. The Thought Factory podcast is brought to you by Never the Same, whose vision is to see new generations transformed in Christ to further the kingdom of God. Learn more at neverthesame.org. We have an event coming up in the year 2020, July 4th, 2020, calling students from all over the country to join in this movement of student-led prayer and really identifying the issues at their school and seeking God for the responsibility of, of taking care of those, those issues. Talk to the audience in regards to your passion for Claim Your Campus and even what they need to do to become uh, an adult advocate in this realm of, of the public school. The work that Claim Your Campus is doing, you know, reaching students at a young age, challenging them with the gospel, empowering them, you know, to go out and and be, you know, trailblazers for Christ in their community 
and then encouraging them to engage in prayer regularly on their campus. Man, I think uh, I just believe that prayer changes things. I don't think there's anything more important in the life of a child or I guess the life of anyone than your relationship with Christ. I mean, that's a more pressing issue than anything politically that we talk about, you know, for Christ followers, you're talking about where you're going to spend an eternity with. And so what Claim Your Campus is doing is uh, eternal work. And so I celebrate I celebrate uh, what you guys are about. I celebrate the idea that you're coming on campuses and uh, empowering and activating students into prayer, active prayer, and, you know, being, in essence, missionaries on their campus to, to lead people to Christ. And so uh, what's going on in 2020, I think is going to be awesome. Uh, I hope to see students from all over the country, hopefully even all over the world where they'll come together and be unified. I even think about, you know, in the book of John where Christ talks about that, right? Like uh, that his followers would be one. And so if students, you know, in a time where, where the adults are so divided on so many things, if students could come together and say, hey, we are followers of Christ and, and be trailblazers in this country, um, from a Christian perspective and then even maybe a political or cultural perspective, uh, I think that would I think that'd be fantastic. And so I celebrate that. Uh, if there are any adults uh, that that want to jump on board with that, I think you could do really no greater of a work imparting into young people's lives and leading them and discipling them and being followers of Christ and stretching themselves and and showing to the world that, you know, the gospel is what saves. There's nothing greater. And so my hat's off to you guys, man. You know, teachers get a lot of credit for for what we do. And even though I'm no longer a teacher, you know, teachers get a lot of credit. But the real credit goes to you guys, man. Um, teachers change people for their time on earth. You guys are setting people up for eternity. So I celebrate it. You can find more information on Claim Your Campus 2020 at claimyourcampus.com slash CYC2020. If you are interested in becoming a, an adult advocate, if you are somebody in your community that has a deep passion for seeing students bring change upon the school campus, go to claimyourcampus.com slash CYC2020 to find out more and sign up to become an adult advocate. Josh, I, again, appreciate your time and uh, your dialogue into this matter and it's always good to connect with you. Always good hanging out with you, brothers. Love you guys. Love you too.